G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Today we're doing a 12-team, 9-category head-to-head mock draft with Alex Raclean. Let's go! Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! Brian, to Jack! Not a game, not a game, not a game. We talking about practice. LeBron James with no record for human life! Here's these G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Case, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. And uh, like we said on the top of the show, guys, we're doing a 12-team head-to-head mock draft, and I am joined by a very special guest, first time on the show, I believe, Alex Raclean. How are you, mate? Good to have you on. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. We're doing, a, we're doing a mock draft today, but we're also doing a mock draft on the day that happened to be the morning, 4.30 in the morning my time, uh, where <clears throat> Damian Lillard was traded. So before we start on this mock, just your real brief thoughts on the trades and uh, the fallout of that one, because it's going to be the big hot topic of the day. Uh, and then we'll get into our, our mock draft over here, which we've got set up. Uh, Aiton's the big winner. No, Most people are saying pretty similar stuff there. Drew Holiday is not staying in Portland. No, no. So, he's not. so we don't have to, so we can just treat it as though he's already gone, um, which, you know, the good news for the Simon Sharp and, um, and Chet that there will be no incoming uh, guards competing with them for minutes. I think that's pretty safe to assume. Um, I think if you're in a deep league, I think Connaughton is, is, going to see a bit of a boost here and that's not something I'm seeing a lot of. And the other takeaway I have is I do think this is a better deal than what Miami was offering given who Portland is and where they are right now. I I agree. I think especially because you've got to factor into the fact that they're going to be trading Drew Holiday and there's more pieces going to come back in a deal there. So um, yeah, I do, I do agree with you on that point there. It is, Annoying that there is still more trades to be done with Drew Holiday. Hopefully that happens sooner rather than later. But yeah, um, I have just recorded before we did this mock draft, uh, my thoughts on a Damian Lillard trade. So if you want my full thoughts, go over and check that one out. But we are going to start this mock draft here. Everyone's in the draft room. Hopefully that has just kicked off there. Cool. So you are picking, and you were telling me before off air here, that you are picking at pick two, and you have, for you, a, a tough decision to make. Yeah, I actually think two is sort of difficult this year uh, between Doncic, SGA, and Halliburton. And and I do have him beat as a clear five for me. I know he's kind of been the consensus too. Um, but... I, I I think that all three of those and Embiid, if you want to go that way, I don't. I, I'm fine with taking him to it. I'm not going to fight you on it. But uh, I I do have all three of them above, and I and I go back and forth between with my order of the three. I went with it, with Luca here. Um, just the the points assist combo while still providing a ton of rebounds. It's just so hard to fight with that. Oh, and our board went Luca, SBA, yeah, Halliburton before Embiid. I love it. They, 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 they knew you on the show and they've gone with your <laughs> order and uh, they've, you know, these people follow me on Twitter and this is not the order I have. They said, stuff, Mitch, let's, <laughs> Alex is on the show. We're going to do what he does. Uh, so yeah, that's an interesting order. I don't know if that happens very often in the draft, but Luca, Shea oh, and Tyrese go off the board after Jokic in two, three and four. Look, it's, I don't think it's crazy to, to say. I definitely understand the thought process. I, I personally have Embiid as number two and then these next three guys in a big clump. Um, so see what Coboy does. He's running down the clock. He's been shook up by the, the draft order to this point. He takes Embiid there. Um, yeah. And then to me at six, it's it's Tatum pretty clearly. Um, do you have... Do you think it's clear with Tatum over Curry? I, I do. I just think the age thing, I think the uncertainty with the Chris Paul situation, I think he loses out a few assists. I, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, the fit there. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think Steph is clearly the seventh guy for me as well, but 
Uh, Tatum, to me, just feels a lot safer. I think their production is kind of similar anyways, younger. So I just lean that way uh, right. when there's not too much difference, in my opinion. But would, would you go a different order? Um, it's another one where it a little bit depends on my mood and it'll depend on my competition as well. Um, um, the, not to, not to put too fine a point on it, but the tougher I perceive my competition, the more willing I'll, I am to take the sort of quote risk yeah. on Steph staying healthy. Whereas if it's a league where I feel like, no, I should win this. I should be the best person in here then I would go with Tatum because I feel like he's got the much higher floor. Um, I was all set and ready to uh, I don't know, shock the world, but I was going to take LaMelo Ball at number eight here. But Steph falls to me at number eight, so I will be picking him. I would have gone Steph at seven, and then I am now in the camp where I think LaMelo Ball is the guy at number eight. I used to have, I think a few weeks ago, I had Giannis there, but I'm just... Just pushing him a little bit further back down. Obviously, the trade today. I don't think that affects him too much, but it's more the fact that his knee... um, Now, I think the trade helps at least the narrative of him getting his defensive stats back up, but that did fall away last season. Um, Mm -hmm. So even in a minus one ranking setting, he he probably doesn't reach quite this high. So for me, I'm leaning more towards Lamelo Ball at eight, but didn't have that um, decision to make. I took Steph Curry at eight, which I think is fine. And then Lillard goes off the board at nine. Now, let's talk. We talked about it a little bit more in general, but where are you taking Lillard now that he's a member of the Milwaukee Bucks? Um, him going to the Bucks is better than some of the other options, and so I'm fine with him in the first round. Nine does feel early to me. I would rather Giannis. I would rather KD. I would rather Anthony Davis. And I'm willing to entertain the risk of an Anthony Edwards over Lillard. I, Lillard's getting old. Like, I I love the guy. He's super fun. But he's, he, what's he, 30 now? 33 now? 30, yeah, 33. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I'm confirming that. But, yeah, I think he, like, small point, yeah, he's 33. Small point guards at 33, like, you're running into some risk there. Um, yeah. So it's interesting you said I, that you I'm, think it's again, I'm fine with it, but I, I, it's not where I would have gone. Yeah. I, I think it just to me confirms that like that top eight and the separation between LaMelo Ball, in my opinion, and then those next guys gets bigger. But I, it's interesting that you said that you think there was worse options that he, I actually think this is one of the not so good options for him to go to because this is one of the few scenarios where he goes to a team where he is not the number one guy. And I know he's a great offensive player, but it, this is Giannis's team, in my opinion. It will always yeah. be Giannis's team as long as he's there. So if he went to Toronto, like Lillard's the number one dude, like don't talk to me about Pascal Siakam or Scotty Barnes, it's Lillard. Um, Miami yeah. Heat, Yes, Jimmy Butler's there, but Lillard's a much better offensive player. He's getting more shots than, than, than a Jimmy Butler. So going to somewhere like Milwaukee, I think that that impacts his usage and shot attempts more, which we know is the big selling point for, for Steph Curry. Uh, sorry, for Damian Lillard in his game. Um, yeah, so th- those, are, those are my thoughts. But again, I still think he's going to be Dame. So um, yeah. it, it's, it's hard to argue against him. And, and in a minus one setting, he is always someone that, that does project really well because he's got such good strengths in points, threes, free throw percentage, um, assists there as well. All right, now I, I, have to I make guess I was saying compared to like the Clippers or the or the Seventy Sixers, um, and I actually think the Heat would have been a little worse than you do, but it's all new. But you're up. Yeah, yeah. Let's have a look here now. Uh, I've taken Steph Curry here. Um, now, what I've been preaching is I've liked a punt assist build with a Steph Curry. So I'm going to take... Oh, jeez, who do I go here? Let's go... Actually, you know what? I'm just going to go to the guy I think is the next best guy. Here's another guard on the board. I'm going to take Curry Irving at this point at pick number... What's that? 17. I think he's first round uh, value per game or there or thereabouts. He is someone that I'm a little bit, maybe we're not talking enough about the mix with him and Luca. I think the assists drop back a little bit from what we expect, but he's still a guy that's going to score efficiently. He actually gets decent defensive stats for a guard as well, both uh, steals and blocks uh, for a point guard. Really efficient, so I'm going to take him there. And again, I might be leaning towards a punt assist later, but it gives me the flexibility that I don't have to at this point. 
you're overlooking a key factor, which is I just don't want him. I don't want to be <laughs> rooting for him. I don't want my fantasy. I don't want my NBA season spent hoping Kyrie Irving does well. Yeah. Um, I, I was on that ride Kenny, last year, and uh, look, there was there was a patch there where it was very very stressful, but it came good in the end. It came good in the end. Um. Also, I, m- that does affect me, and I think that it's fair to let that affect you. Like oh, this so is too. supposed to be fun. It's okay to like not draft a player you don't like, but also like his injury history is as bad as anyone's. And he's one of the only players in the last 10 years to just go literally a wall, like literally away without leave. (laughs) Has how many other players have done that? Oh, dang. I was really hoping that either Trey or cat or Jaron would go would be there for me and they were three of the last four picks hold on i gotta so you're that. on the clock here while you're you're, you're sweating and, and making decisions i'll just recap the the picks that went so obviously uh fair few picks to recap so obviously Lillard went at nine Giannis at 10 durant 11 davis went at 12 i think that's your stock standard top 12 edwards went at 13 sabonis pretty up there at 14 booker 15 donovan mitchell at 16, I got Kyrie at 17. Then it went Bam, who's shot back up into the second round, obviously, since that um, news today. Trey, yep. uh, Mikael Bridges, Towns. Jaron Jackson went just before you, and then you've got Desmond Bain, and it's quickly back over to you, so I'll let you have a think about your next pick there. I don't um, have to think about oh, it. Oh, okay. We're going to have, a, we're gonna have a discussion about this because uh, I think – I think we there was this was a, a round table from weeks ago that we we talked yeah. about. You, you're very high on Walker Kessler. I would not be I didn't caught. Mean to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would not be caught taking him in the third round. But you've gone him here at the start of the third round. What what are your thoughts? Defend yourself, Alex, on on Walker Kessler and and why you're so high on him. Um. So I've been taking Walker Kessler, and I did a mock on a different pod uh, recently, and I did Walker Kessler at the beginning of the third round there too. It's um, it's very much my my go to move, um, and I think that a potential league leader in blocks that alone is worth consideration in the third round. I think that he is uh, improving. I think that his twenty eight point five minutes that he had for the second half of last year is the floor for his workload. So I think his points are going to tick up to like respectable and his rebounds, I think could easily be top 10, if not top five to eight in the league. Um, I mean, five years ago, this is where we were taking Rudy Gobert year after year. And he's, he's got Rudy Gobert stats, which that's not my original point, but uh, someone else made that, t- and I was like, "Yeah, you're right, actually." Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it is a fair point. I, I, my, my hesitation is one: he's so bad in so many categories. He's so great in uh, a bunch of categories as well. He's extremely polarizing in his in his values, like extreme field goal percentage, extreme blocks, great rebounds, but he gets no assists, he gets no steals, he scores poorly. So um, especially early in a draft like this, when you're drafting Walker Kessler and then I'm drafting Larry Markin or Jimmy Butler went right before, these guys are going to be 20, 25 point per game players and you're going to get guys going to put up, what, 13 points maybe. Yeah. Um, it's it's a tough thing to come back off. Yes, you can look to punt that category. That's fine, yes. Um, but I just think, and this year especially as well, You've got Wemby, you've got Chet, you've got all these other guys in the back end like Gafford, uh, Duran, Walker, uh, sorry, um, Mark Williams. I think that blocks are going to be more readily available this season than they have in the past previous season. So, yes, you can say he's going to lead the league in blocks, but I don't think he's going to be gigantically away from the rest of the pack in that category where I feel like you can get more of the categories in the statistics that are going to be harder to find, like points, free throw percentage, assists. You're not going to be able to find those in the bunches that you can blocks later in the draft. But again, if you project him out on a nine-category rankings, he might actually be here. Um, I just think from a team-building point of view, it, it's not where I would go. Um, fair. I I like punting points. I think that it's a very oh, I do too. Um, I love attractive team build. But also, uh, with... With Bain and Luca as my first two, um, I'm not punting points. I'm just letting everyone else catch up. 
Um, <laughs> you know, looking across the first two rounds, um, I guess Embiid Bridges probably scores close to Luca Bain. Uh, Trey Tatum, that's more points. Curry, 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 Kyrie, what you have is more points. Lillard, Mitchell is more points. Um, but I'm solidly in the middle of the pack or upper middle of the pack in points after two rounds. I can take a small hit and, and I think I can be fine. Yeah, I think I think it's just definitely something you're going to have to put yourself in a position that you're going to have to focus on that, and uh, which is fine. But uh, or yeah. you look to punt it, and like like you said, I I am a big fan of punting points. It's just quietly one of my favorite strategies this season. But um, you do need to be aware of things like your percentage and things like that, which obviously yeah. Walker Kessler helps with. One of those. Um, I am on the queue here now. Now my last pick, I put picked uh, Larry Markinen. Again, I'm going to be leaning more into a punt assist, maybe also a punt steals build now as well as often the two things that I like to go ahead and do. So um, I went with Larry Markin there. I'm also going to draft here at this spot. Again, I'm getting a lot of guards early, but Jordan Poole is a player that I really am in on this season because of his points, his three uh, free throw percentage, his threes. And now in what a team that I would consider, again, I'm going to go in a bit of a punt assist strategies, but I've got three guards already available on my team. So now I can go ahead in the later rounds and pick up a lot of my centers and forwards. Um, and I've got these guards to short my free throw percentage and three pointers and points, which are going to be harder to pick up when I go for some of those bigger guys later uh, as at least my strategy. And generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that, um, that, Big men are more often to come up on early season waivers than than guards. I, I think that that's yeah. I think just that's fair traditionally to say. over time, you're more likely to find a steady impact if you're if you're good on waivers early in the year. You're more likely to find a a reliable big than a reliable guard. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably accurate. Um, now let's recap a few of these picks here. After you, we'll go all the way back down. But after you pick Kessler, Cade Cunningham went off the board. Then James Harden in the third round. Victor Wembanyama straight after that. Darren Fox, Evan Mobley was sniped right before me, my guy. Uh, then I went with Larry Markin, and then Chet went off the board. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George fairly late in that third round, which is interesting. Um, Darius Garland then went, Miles Turner, LeBron James, um, Kristaps Porzingis, Jalen Brunson, I went with Poole, then Jamal Murray, Pascal Siakam, DeMar DeRozan, and OG Ananobi. And it's coming back up to you. Are you do you have anyone in your sights that you're wanting to target in this spot? Yeah, I have one, I, I, it's actually going to be a big pivot point in my draft. I have one guy that I want, and my backup choice will lead me towards probably punting points, which would be a disappointment for having taken Luka first. There we go. Okay, I'm I'm taking Jalen Brown. And Jalen Brown. Now, okay. And now I can get about my points again. Um, I might be middle of the pack because of because 13 is so much less than 20. But I feel and Claxton was my backup. Yeah. So that that would definitely steer you into that like punt point situation if you that. But Jalen Brown gives you a fighting chance to to keep yeah. it going there. While you're on the clock here, um, I'll. I'll Play the the question here, and uh, and you give you time to sort of think about it. But what are your thoughts about Jalen Brown and and how he's going to be affected by Kristaps Porzingis coming to town as opposed to Marcus Smart being the guy who was there in the starting lineup beforehand? Sorry, I'll, I'll maybe give you a chance to have a, have a think there. But after you went Jalen Brown, Nick Claxton went off the board, and Drew Holiday went there as well. Drew's an interesting nice. one. So Drew went. What was that pick? Pick forty nine. Again, with the trade and uncertainty there, it could be fine, but yeah, it's hard to know exactly where he's going to go. If he was on the Clippers, that might be a bit high. Exactly. If he's on the Heat. If he ends up on the Heat, then that's fine. That's okay. That's a fine yeah. guy. Yeah, but on the Clippers, but, maybe not so much, so it's hard to hard to really tell yeah. there. You went with Zion Williamson after that, which um, at 50? Take a swing take a swing. Yeah. Look, I, I like it. I think it's good. I think that there's real upside in Zion this season. I'm typically the anti-Zion guy, but this year, I just think there's something to it. And there goes DeAndre Ayton, which I actually think, at what was that, 52? I actually good value, think that's, yeah, that's good value. Um, he probably he probably should probably have been... Gone higher. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I might have might have considered him instead of Jordan Poole, but um, <laughs> I think that's, that's an interesting spot to him. But talk me through what I asked you before about the Jalen Brown and Christoph Spazinger's acquisition. How do you think that affects um, him from a usage point? Does it affect him at all? Or do you think he's the same as last year? 
essentially. I mean, on some level, it has to, right? You you you're losing Marcus Smart, who is a relatively low usage player, and the primary replacement is a much higher usage player. That's going to affect. It's probably not going to affect the superstar on the team, Jason Tatum. So no. it's got to come from somewhere. Um, but I don't. I do think Jalen Brown is is a fixture that you build around it, and you get Porzingis to work with him, not the other way around. So it might hurt Jalen a little bit, but I don't think it hurts him a ton. And at forty seven, um, I haven't checked recently, but. I feel like Jalen Brown has outperformed 47 most recent years. Um, so even if he does take a slight hit, I think I'm still kind of profiting at this draft spot. Um, no, actually, that's only partially true um, for Nine Cat. Uh, he, he, he's profited on that two of the last three years. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, Porzingis probably hurts more than he helps, but I don't think it's going to be a massive hit. No, it's I don't just, think it's going to yeah. be a massive hit. I think I think it'll be a small hit, but at the same time, it, it's still going to be Tatum and Brown. Like, it's still their team. It, it might be the difference between him scoring, uh, again, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but scoring 25 and maybe scoring 23. Um, yeah. But... Again, that's not going to kill 27 me. last year down yeah. to 24 or yeah, something. Yeah. It's not going to be the, the, the worst thing in the world for Jalen Brown. And I like what you just did. I So you took Gobert at 56. Yeah. And I think that he should be going in the mid-50s. I, I think... I wonder if you could have gotten him around later. I was considering that. That was what I was but, considering, but I didn't like a lot of the other options. So. But that's where he should be going. I still think you got good value. Um and like a lot of the time people, the people who are following the super closely are going to say like, Oh, Rudy Gobert's ADP has gone up. That means we've got to sort of cool off and stay away. I think Rudy Gobert's ADP is way too low. I think it can rise to where you just took him and him still be a totally fine pick. I think that's a totally fine pick. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it definitely in, in my build, I've got the free throw percentage that I can a hundred percent absorb his poor free throw percentage. I need his field goal to, um, uh, help the the Jordan Pool pick that I picked just beforehand as well, um, yep. and I'm looking for those blocks and rebounds as well in my team. So I don't care about the fact that he doesn't give me assists. That's fine. Um, I would have loved someone like a Jade, um, uh, a DeAndre Ayton to be there, but obviously he's going to be going higher than this now yep. as well. So that was sort of the option that I was left with. I didn't love a lot of other options that were around there. So like I said, I maybe could have waited another round, another few picks for him to come back to me. Um, but just thought I'd lock that away because he kind of fit exactly what I needed um, moving uh, forward. So after him went uh, Josh Giddy, Alperen Shangoon, and Bradley Beal, Devin Purcell, and Paolo Bunkero at 61 to me. And I'll get your thoughts on this. I think that is... Very high for Paolo Boncaro in a category leagues. In a points league, it's probably even value. Um, but in a category leagues, look, he could reach this. He could get here. But Ooh, you're... Speaking of drafting at, at upside. Oh, Scoot Henderson. Far out. 63. We're going crazy now, aren't we? Um, Jesus. Okay, we'll talk about that one a second one. But, but <laughs> pa- Paolo Boncaro, do you, is this the round of spot you are targeting him? Or do you think, like me, that this is too early? No, my response to both players is the same. Scoot Henderson, I am 100% convinced, is going to be um, a, an impact player in this league. Just today, I was considering whether I'm, I'm in my sort of deep dynasty league, whether I offer Anthony Davis for Scoot. That's how high I am on Scoot. Um, yeah. But in a one-year league, yes. 63 is his best-case scenario. 61 is Paolo's best case scenario. You you can't win a league when you're drafting a player and and the best case is you break even. So yeah, it's way too early for yep. both of them. And 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 they're both good players. They are both probably going to be top 30 fantasy players in a couple of years, but they're not there yet. Point guards, rookie point guards for the most part suck. They, they're not good. They're, they're especially not good in the first three months of the season because 
They're usually poor mm. from the field. Um, Scoot especially doesn't shoot threes very well. He's actually not a, a great free throw shooter either. Um, so he's going to be inefficient. He's going to hurt you with turnovers. He's going to hurt you with uh, poor free throw percentage. Um, I think the assists are going to be nice. He will be getting good volume. But again, like you said, you're drafting him at this spot and you're just cutting off the ceiling completely and leaving yourself no room to actually get value. So um, in my projections before this, like we said, we, we knew Damian Little was going to get traded at some point. So I actually mm. don't view Scoot all that much differently compared Same. to what I was viewing him beforehand, where... Mm. Uh, I was fine where he was going, sort of that 90s to 100 range um, versus if he's now going to be someone that goes in the 60s and 70s. I'm, I'm well out of that because, um, yeah, I don't think that's where he should be going. You're coming up here. It is your pick on the clock. I'll just recap a few guys that went after Scoot. So Jarrett Allen went. Then I took Franz Wagner, just a, I don't know, all around Guy that I think is a, a good pick at that point. Mark Williams went after that. Vucevic, my bust candidate of the year so far, went after that. I actually think that's not a bad spot to get him. Uh, Julius Randle went. Tyler Hero and then Brooke Lopez. Now, you are on the clock here, Alex. Who are you uh, Who are you considering? Oh, he's... Uh... I am going to go Simons. Okay, Anthony Simons, is this is this boosted by the news of today's trade? Like, is this something that you no. maybe weren't taking him this high beforehand, but you are now, or is it this is where you always kind of viewed him? As you said, I've been treating all three of Simons, Sharp, and um, and Scoot. I said Chad earlier. I meant Scoot. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've been treating all three of them as though Lillard is gone and the replacement is not a impact guard. Um, I've been treating that as sort of my default assumption all year. So no, I, I think that in a Lillard list Portland environment, this is probably roughly where Simons is going to land. And he does have some upside to as the, as sharp and scooter getting their legs under them sort of be better than this, especially for the first half of the year. He'd definitely be, especially if I'm drafting him, in at 71 a lot of the time he falls farther than that yeah. um especially at 71 uh, he's someone i'm gonna look to trade at the midway point of the season i expect him to tail off as the That's young guys pick up yeah as but, you um, um as you make your pick here i'll give my thoughts I, I, i'm probably a fair bit lower on simons than than you are i think and, and and this is my rationale because I can definitely see the upside there. Obviously, with no little that he could definitely step into a larger role. My thing for him was when he really showed out and when it really balled out and performed well in fantasy was when he was playing point guard in um, direct replacement of a Damian Lillard. In this now team, he's not going to be getting the opportunity to do that as much because Scoot Henderson is there. He will get a little bit of that um, increased role compared to just strictly, you know, playing as a shooting guard because, like you said, it, Scoot's first year, he's a rookie, he's going to be still getting his legs underneath him. But again, Scoot, he's played two years in the G League. He's not like your typical rookie. He's got he's physically ready. Uh, I think he's going to be playing a, a big time on ball there. So I just have a little bit more skepticism about him bringing the assists that he will need to generate the good fantasy rankings and good fantasy production. He'll give you points. He'll give you threes. He'll shoot well from the free throw line. But he'll give you not much else in my opinion. Um, and I'm not really expecting too much bump in the assists. I think that's all fair. I think that's all fair. I, I'm, I, just, I didn't really love the board. I, I was also considering, it's a Jeremy weird spot. Grant, but, yeah. Yeah, but like Jeremy Grant, I, I would be drafting him at his upside. His best case is finishing around 70th. Um, so I, I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I was just going with a player who I liked and with Zion already on the team, I was a little afraid of going with John Morant, uh, just starting the game, starting the season with all those missed games, plus Zion's propensity to just like miss a week or more at any time. I was a little afraid of, of having two kind of high picks, with that much risk baked in. Uh, so that was another one I considered, but passed. Austin yeah. Reeves, in hindsight, I actually wish I had gone with Austin Reeves instead of Simons. He was yeah. just a little bit lower down on the queue, and I kind of missed him. Um, 
It's tough. It's tough doing a podcast and drafting as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's much harder to talk during than to just <laughs> to yeah. just do it. Um, um, now, I have got the choice here, which I feel like I will have a choice in a few drafts here between Jalen Duran and a Daniel Gafford. I'm going to be going with my gut here and going with a Jalen Duran at this spot at pick 80. I am a huge fan of him long term, but also for this season. I just think that last year, like you sort of said with Walker Kessler, when he started... He put up 10 points, 10 rebounds on 65% and blocked a shot per game. To me, that is the bare minimum for him. I think compared to Walker Kessler, who's maybe, I want to say, three years older, Jalen Duran is still a teenager. Um, So he has got a lot more growth, in my opinion. He's someone that in college flashed a lot of playmaking ability. Um, He's maybe a little bit more of a creative scorer. So I think that this is why, again, just to not to... Beat, uh, beat the dead horse here, but this is why I'm down a bit more on a Walker Kessler because like, you can get someone like a da- Jalen Duran at this, but he's not going to block as many shots as Walker Kessler, but the, the rebounds, the field goal percentage, the scoring is all going to be quite similar, and I think he's got more upside and maybe some of those other things in maybe uh, assists and steals and um, I'm, more scoring. I think, I think you're under... I really like Duran long-term. I really like Duran as a player, and if you're right about his role, then I think this will be a a good to very good pick. I am worried about the amount of bigs fighting for minutes yeah. on a Pistons team with a coaching staff that we don't trust. Um, that is, that terrifies me. And so I wouldn't take Darren for another two plus rounds um, because I don't trust that the minutes will be there. If I trusted that the minutes would be there, then absolutely, you know, throw your parade for, for getting him at 80. But uh, I don't. I also funny the guy who drafted right before you took Reeves. He took Mark Williams in the sixth round, which I think is super high. I haven't seen Mark Williams That's going that high. Um, but if you flip those picks, if you put Austin River, Austin Reeves in the sixth, and Williams in the mid seventh, yeah, it looks, it a, lot looks better. a little better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, at the end of the day, it's not not the worst thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that is a bit high for Williams. The the one thing I've I, and I'm going to be doing a video on Williams soon as well. That um just to give everyone a bit of a sneak peek. Um, but the interesting thing with him was when he was coming off the bench and playing like 16 minutes per night, he was blocking 1.1 shots per game. Then when he was the starter playing 27 minutes a night, he was blocking 1.1 shots per game. So um, the blocks didn't scale up with the minutes, which is often something that we do see, especially with young centers, that to stay out on the court, to avoid foul trouble, they need to lower the block rate, lower yeah. the aggressiveness in which they chase those blocks. So, uh, And Mark Williams definitely showed that last year. And um, for someone who was such a, a huge shot blocker in college, we haven't actually seen that carry across to the NBA when he got, you know, decent minutes so far, which is... So, to, you know, <laughs> if you're going to keep making fun of my, my Kessler pick, I'm going to keep defending it. One thing that I really like about Kessler is his minutes, his blocks did scale did. with his yes. minutes. You're right. Because you, you had a long sample of him um, at, like, limited minutes, like 20 or something minutes per game uh, before before he, you know, there's, like, a pretty clear demarcation line, and then he's playing 28 minutes per game. And his blocks per minute is almost identical between those two segments of the season. And that is something that I, I view as part of my justification for my high rank on him. I mean, it's definitely safe. Like these guys, the guys that we are drafting later, they're going later because we don't, we haven't seen it yet, right? Like it's, we're yeah. projecting, we're predicting, but it, it, there is a risk that obviously it doesn't work out. Now I'm going to continue uh, and build off my shit bloke uh, draft pick from Kyrie Irving <laughs> later with another shit bloke pick here in uh, Miles Bridges. Uh, if we're just talking like fantasy basketball, this guy, look, he's been a top 30, top 40 player before. So yeah. to get him at 89, um, I think if we're strictly talking about winning, he uh, he could definitely do that. There, there is some risks. He's going to miss the first 10 games. He's also a guy who's only signed a qualifying offer in a team that has more depth in that position than the last time he played with them drafting um, at pick two uh, Miller there. So I don't necessarily think he's going to jump straight back into what he was doing before that whole thing. But again, at 89, you've got plenty of room for that to come back a bit. The Hornets very quietly have a, a depth chart clogging problem. Um, yeah, they've got more ro- ro- like 
28 plus minutes per game guys than all those four minutes there. available. Yeah. And they're all um, they're all front court forward players. Like you've got you know PJ Washington, uh, Gordon Hayward, Miles Bridges, uh, Brandon Miller. You know you still got players like JT Thor there, which they drafted somewhat high. And they um, kind of like it seems like. Yeah, or um, at least they pay lip service to it. Yeah, so there's, there are there are a few guys there, and it's one of the more um, uh, yeah weird rotations to figure out, especially if you throw in the fact that. Bridges is going to miss the first 10 games. We're not going to know really how that shapes out for the first month of the season because you're going to have two different factors there. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. And the guy who I was debating to take uh, instead of him went immediately after him in Jabari Smith Jr. So um, that was the other guy I was considering who, if they actually just run one play for him a game, um, could be a lot better this season. I was very high on him last year. Obviously, I was wrong, uh, but I still think he has a chance as a young player to, to step up and break out this year. All also, right. Sharp went one pick before you. He's an eye player I'm keeping my eye on uh, where his ADP settles out. I would I like hate. to have a lot of Sharp this year. I'm, I'm in, in I my, like him. I, I like him. I think he's going to be fun, but uh, I don't know. That's still too early for me. 88 is too early, but if he falls into the late 90s, which he has in a lot of drafts I've been in, I would be like I would be happy to take him at this turn, probably more at the 9-2 than the 8-11. Yeah. Um, All right, you're on the clock here. I'll let you take your picks. While you're doing that, I'll recap those picks. So, yeah, like you said, before my pick went Shaden Sharp, I went with Miles Bridges. Uh, Jabari Smith went after that. Terry Rozier, Clay Thompson went at pick 92. CJ McCollum at 93. Uh, Tyus Jones at 94. And then you went with Marcus Smart loading up on either Celtics or previous Celtics on your team as well now. Um, I think that's good value I'm, for Marcus Smart. I think he's It's uh, good underrated. value. I'm, I'm creating a problem for myself with what happens when Ja comes back and both Bain and Marcus Smart take a hit. Yep. Um, you know, if we were playing this out, I would maybe have to be pursuing a trade. or I, I would have to be keep that on the front of my mind. Um, and my next pick is a guy whose ADP hasn't changed after Trey Murphy got hurt, and I don't understand why. I, I, Jones at 98. At pick 100? Like, I understand picking him in 130s or whatever or later, wherever he was going, while Trey Murphy was healthy and he ha- was at a risk of sort of falling down the depth chart, but... Um, but that's not the case anymore. Um, I, I'm surprised his ADP is so low and it pick 100. I mean, we're basically in, uh, waiver bait anyways. Um, I mean, it's, it's so I, low because he doesn't do anything really except for steals. I mean, he, he's solid. He gives you a few assists and the percentages are, are nice and it's okay. But I mean, a lot of his value is steals and, and like he'll probably return that level of ranking. It's just, I don't think he has the opportunity to surpass it by much, um, which I don't know, maybe at this point you you are looking for that. Like, um, like Wendell Carter just went a couple picks later. Who was someone I was looking at? Oh, and there goes Ben Simmons at pick 101. Simmons was the I was considering actually. Yeah. Um, obviously more risk with a player like that, but he like, you know, compared to a Herb Jones, I think he's got far more scope to beat this spot. Whereas I don't know if Herb can do that at pick a hundred. Yeah, that's a fair. I like, I also, there's something about having someone whose minutes will increase when Zion is out sort of like a little bit of a, uh, sort of, that had me actually looking at CJ. Had CJ lasted a couple more picks, um, just someone who, when Zion inevitably misses time, can sort of stem the pain of that loss a little bit. Um, that was also on my mind. Again, I don't know if we weren't talking through this draft, I might not have taken him there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I don't hate it. Uh, you're on the clock. I'm on the clock here. I'm deciding between two centers here. One of them is a very hot topic in Yusuf Nurkic, and the other one is or our boy, uh, Celtics fans, in Robert Williams. Um, what do I need? How are my blocks looking? I've got Gobert. I've got 
Look, I'm going to go... I think I'm going to go Robert Williams just because I want to really shore up those blocks a little bit more because Gobert, I'm not 100% sold. He's going to just go back straight away to blocking two shots per game uh, because a lot of that he did without um, Carlton Towns there as well. So I'm going to shore up those blocks. Nurkic might be there on the way back around, like I said before on my video. I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but um, I kind of see Nurkic as the same, if not slightly worse, on a Phoenix Suns on a game-to-game basis. I probably have more confidence that he's going to be playing the entire season. But when he was on Portland, there was no one really there to back him up. Whereas I think Eubanks is, uh, you know, funnily enough, his old teammate um, is probably a, a better player than anyone that was on the Portland Trailblazers like a Moses Brown, for example. And instead mm-hmm. of him playing 29, 30, 31 minutes a night, it's maybe 26, 27 minutes a night. Like It's not that big of a difference, but... And I'm interested to see the fact that he's still probably going around where he was beforehand. I thought he might go up a bit higher, but that hasn't happened so far in this draft. Um, It's also worth sort of noting, might not be relevant, especially over such a small sample size um, of one year. And, you know, he's just joining in September. But Phoenix is historically one of the best medical staffs um, in the league. And so for a player who's had a lot of injuries, you know, you'd much rather them land in, in Phoenix than a lot of other places. Yep. Um, uh, that's, that's been something that's sort of worked out pretty well. I agree. I think you absolutely made the right call going with Robert Williams. Um, I started a bit of a center if, run, it looks like. A um, bunch, yeah. bunch of centers come off the board after that. But yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's quite late for, for Rob Williams. I, mean, I, I normally see him go a bit further, a bit earlier than that, but 104. Um, I'll, cop, uh, I'll cop the seven points per game at that spot. That's around where I saw him go in the, ma- the mock I did a few days ago, actually. Okay. But Might be the sample size of one, but... There you go. So um, after, after Rob Williams went Mitch Robinson, then Zach uh, Collins, then Jonas Valanciunas and Yusuf Nurkic. To me, one of these players is not like the other, and that is Jonas Valanciunas <laughs> I'm at that spot. I just don't love the fit with him in the Pelicans lineup. They obviously showed a preference to play players like Larry Nance Jr. at, at least equal time to him, especially when someone like Zion is healthy. So, I don't know. Of all those centers that went there, I think he's the one I'm the lowest on. Nurkic then went, and then my guy, Tobias Harris, who I actually had in my queue there for everyone who says I'm a Tobias Harris hater. Uh, I think this is a perfect spot to get him. Um, Absolutely. Because he's going to be safe and solid in a head-to-head league. This is the biggest thing I've always said about him. He, in a minus one ranking, in my projections, is 130th. In a nine category rankings, he's like 80th. Um, so two of those two things can be true at the same time. He's just so average across the board that whenever people are punting and things, just so many guys just go ahead of him. Uh, but he is just, he's fine. He's, he's okay yep. at that spot. Yeah. And um, I mean, oh, and there goes the guy, Paul Reed, 111. What, what are your thoughts on Paul Reed at 111? Is that too early for you? Is, yeah. Yeah. By like a million. Yeah. What? You're off on Paul Reed. He's the hype guy at the moment. I, why? He might start. <laughs> he might start. I don't know. I'm, I'm big on it. I, th- I think there's something to it. Um, I mean, I'm, I've lowered him down a little bit since Kelly Oubre, but this guy per minute is is a, is a fly that you, you can probably take. I think it's maybe a tiny bit early optimally, but... I think it's I think it's early, and again, I'm not trusting that the minutes are there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many minutes would you hope to, him to get to, love- to draft him at this spot? Uh, at this spot, I, I mean, twenty-five plus. I think. I think to to return top one hundred value, I think he only needs twenty to twenty-three minutes, and I am really panicking here because I got, had not thought running yeah. out of time. <laughs> that was a real panic <laughs> pick I had not thought of that pick at all but uh, I'm just going to take I don't know Zubats there at 113 probably not too much value but again I'm just shoring up my centers I'm not worrying about assists and steals so need those rebounds and field goal percentage before it dries up and then I'll start taking my flies in the next picks here so yeah let's talk a bit more people Paul so you're not a fan of of the I mean the, the whole hype has come from the, the quotes come, coming from Nick Nurse and saying that he's going to be playing next to Joel Embiid. He's going to be playing a lot bigger of a role this season now. We don't know exactly what that means. Um, Nick, Nick Nurse is known, known for his honesty. Very, very, yeah. I mean, but 
On the flip side, if you get in Nick Nurse's good books, you could play 36 minutes a night. Uh, I'm not expecting that, sure. but he is someone that I think is at least super interesting. And when you're getting to – I've always said if you get to your last starting roster spot, you can take a flyer on a guy that you would, might take on a bench as a flyer on the presumption that on your first bench spot, you maybe have to then take someone who's a bit more boring and a bit more solid in production. You're just kind of going a pick around early on on the flyer zone than others if you are really sold on a certain player. And um, I can see it with with Paul Reed. Now, there is obviously risks, um, and he could completely flame out. You drop him two weeks into the season, but I do see it. We've been been excited about B-Ball Paul for, I feel like, a long time, and the minutes just keep not really showing. I guess he's only been in the league for three years, but... I feel like the excitement around him has been around for longer. Yeah. Um, but the quotes, Alex, the quotes, they're so juicy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm taking two sort of scoring veterans who will hopefully keep me boosted. You know, this is another reason that I think it's okay to take Walker Kessler. Gary Trent is always available late. Um, Bogdanovich is always available late. Uh, these are guys who are going to get good minutes and going to score and make some threes. Um, so, you know, I, I do, we're in the range where I, it's important to get a couple guys with upside. Like for example, the guy who went right after me, uh, Bogdanovich's teammate, Tom Thompson, yep. uh, the rookie, it's important to be drafting upside players, but I've also already taken some risks yep. with, Zion, most most notably, and Kessler. Kessler is a risk. Um, and so it's okay to, as similar to what you were just saying, it's okay to take some sort of more boring guys who can sort of reliably fill in top 100 production at pick 122 and, 120, and 119. Yeah, it's it's all about what you've done up until that point. Like you've got you've got to balance out your roster. Like you can't have a team full of risks because you know uh, right. what are the chances that all of those risks pay off? Um, probably okay. very small. But if you take a few at select times, then those can really pay off. And if you bring that in with some guys that are providing at least value of where you've drafted them, maybe slightly better, even if it's slightly worse, not going to kill you. Those are the situations where you're going to be in, in the best spot possible. And um, his teammate or his brother, I should say, um, went two spots later in a men Thompson. So nearly we, we're this close to getting back to back Thompson uh, picks, which yeah. I would have very much enjoyed. Um, and then Benedict Matherin. So we are on to the young players, all the fly picks here. Any of those that you'd like considerably more than others. Are you what where are your thoughts on Amen versus Asar? Like are you still Asar first, Amen second? Yes, I am. Um I think that um Ime is of the two coaching staffs, I expect Ime to have a shorter leash with his rookies. Uh and situationally I think Asar has a easier route to minutes um, especially if the guy I drafted, Bogdanovich, gets traded. Uh, even if Bogdanovich doesn't get traded, I think Afsar still has the better route to minutes. Um, and minutes and opportunity are huge. Um, you know, long term, I see no reason to doubt the scouts who say that Amen is the better prospect, but we're talking one year. I would rather the guy who is already more polished and has a better path to minutes. Yeah, I, I think I still tend to agree there. I think it's definitely closer than it was before um, the shit blokeness that was Kevin Porter Jr. Um, occurred. So I think, you know, I could yeah, easily sure. talk, talk myself into the fact that, oh, and there's an interesting pick there. Um, I like that. With uh, I like that. Derek yeah. Lively. I don't mind that at all. So I think that, yeah, with Kevin Porter Jr. no longer going to be playing for this team, I think that you can, even if he is off the bench, and Ben Thompson could easily play minutes in the mid-20s, which for him I think would be enough to be of value. But I do still agree with you that Asar, it, you don't have to sort of talk yourself into it as much. It's sort of like, yeah. it's just there. He's, he's battling with Bogdanovich and Isaiah Stewart. Like, it's not... Yeah. It's, it's not that big of a, of a contest. Um, let's talk about that guy that just went. I, I picked Emmanuel quickly at 128, but a couple of players after that was Jeremy Sohan and Derek Lively the second. What are your thoughts on Lively after those quotes saying that Jason yeah. Kidd maybe wants to start him? Um, do we believe him or is it... No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I don't, I don't think believe him at all. 
I don't believe him at all, but the fact that he's even willing to say it, I yeah. do take as a reason to bump Derek Lively up the board because we don't need Derek Lively to start for him to pay off at pick 130. Um, we just need him to get 25 minutes a game. And the fact that they're even talking about him this way seems to me to improve his chances of achieving that center is the weak spot on that roster. So the path is there, you know, the other guys are older and boring and have a length, lengthy injury histories. Um, so there are other opportunities, even if he doesn't start opening night, there are other opportunities through injury and, you know, not to compare like the long skinny Duke uh, one and done to the long skinny Duke one and got done, but his game does kind of remind me of Mark Williams and you know, that worked. I think, I think the, the comparison I've seen thrown around, which I, I kind of now with those quotes kind of, I find pretty funny is the Tyson Chandler comparison. And obviously, um, you know, Jason Kidd played on a team that won the championship with Tyson Chandler, so maybe yeah. there's an affinity for that. You're up, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got my guy here. Um, the, like that, <laughs> that's the that's the reason that he likes him. I don't know. I don't know. If that's that's me getting real deep in the conspiracy theory. But um, yeah, I am surprised that this guy's fallen this far. I, reflecting, I might have taken him in the last pick if I'd um, been talking less. But I'm going to go with Trey Murphy here at pick 137. I know he's injured, but like we've got what three more picks left. I'm just going to pop him on IR. And when he comes back in in a team like mine, where I'm punting uh, assists, I don't care about that. And he's going to be super efficient for me. So I'm pretty happy to get Trey Murphy there. I'm not expecting him until December, mid December, but um, I think last season it to me, again, we can always debate whether or not coaches think the same way, but he showed his importance to this team and his ability to space the floor is super valuable for a team that has Zion Williamson on it. The, my concern is just the, it's, is the meniscus and the way, you know, that it's one of the injuries like plantar fasciitis or, or other plantar fascia injuries where even once they're back, their performance, they come back much quicker than their performance comes back. Uh, and that's what I'm worried about with Murphy. Uh, if he hadn't had this injury, I wouldn't even have considered Herb Jones where I had, and I would have, and I would have had Murphy probably in the top 70 um, love the guy. It's, it's just that particular injury is one of those ones that actually does kind of scare me. When, um, when would you that. expect him to be a hundred percent Trey Murphy this season? Like, do you think he's, he's, we project it to be on like when, January or February. Like when do you expect him to sort of ramp up to, to mm-hmm. his full pace? The longer, he takes to return to game the quicker I expect him to, to achieve his full Trey Murphiness. So if they have him playing games in late November, then I'm going to be out on Trey Murphy for the season. Yeah. I think they're rushing it and I'm not going to trust it um, all year. If they let him sit past December and he's making his season debut debut late December, early January, then I'm going to say, all right, he got enough rest. This guy might actually be able to put together a run. And I would only need a couple weeks of buildup. But so it's very much dependent on how the team handles it. And are they rushing him? Yeah, I I would expect based on the type of surgery he had, he had the, um, he had the repair, if I'm not mistaken, which is the the one that takes a bit longer to get back to, but has the, better success rate. So to me, Correct. that suggests that they, or at least he is, and, and hope, hoping the team is, um, considering the more long-term um, uh, possibility of, of him being healthy for, for his career. So I'm hoping that means that we get a, a little bit more time on the sidelines so that when he does come back, he's um, there. So I'm expecting him, yeah, mid-December is sort of what I'm projecting him to be back. But I, I guess, yeah, it, it is an unknown. Um, do they rush this team back? I hope they've learned their lessons with Zion Williamson and rushing players back. But again, I don't know. Who, who knows? <laughs> in I don't the know. NBA. Uh, you I went with uh, your third Celtic. Or no, actually, sorry. I think one of them was a, a, an ex-Celtic. One but, of them was an ex-Celtic. Uh, uh, yeah. Malcolm Brogdon there. What do we think about him with the, uh, as you make your pick here, um, in terms of the chemistry of coming back after being traded in the off season, there's a few rumblings about him being not very happy and, and, 
butting of heads and and things like that. Do we think that that's all going to be sorted uh, for the Celtics this season and Brogs in particular, or will that bleed over into production and minutes and performance this year? I oh man, Christian Wood. I thought I ha- might get next time around and instead he went one pick later. Nothing makes me feel dumber than being like, Oh, I can get him next round. And it, I uh, couldn't no, even get yeah. him the next pick. <laughs> um, um, sorry. Malcolm Brogdon. I, so those quotes were weird. He does seem a little, if the quotes are true, um, which is an if, then he does yeah. seem a little bit more upset than I would have expected. Yeah. Um, but we are talking about like one of the consummate professionals of the NBA. We are talking about, you know, he's what VP of the, of the players union. Mm. He he's, he, you know, I think he won a lot of the, I think he won a lot of those like academic and athletic performance awards in college. He's, he's just like an absolute pro. And even if he's upset, I think that he's the, type of guy who is going to see this as his job and he's going to show up to work and he's going to handle himself like a professional. Um, And so I'm assuming that even if there are serious issues, that those are resolved and that he is playing. And, you know, I do, I, I like to take upside picks with my last couple of picks, you know, the worst case is you drop them. And usually for me, that means rookies, but Brogdon is has fallen so far because of the health risks, because he's not the starter, but um, it really wouldn't take much for him to be back in the top 60 t- conversation. Oh, I don't know if he's, that high, but yeah. I, I don't expect it. I don't expect it. Let me be perfectly clear. If I thought that was going to happen, I would have taken him before Gary Trent, like two <laughs> yeah. and a half hours earlier. But um that is in the range of outcomes more for Brogdon than PJ Washington and RJ Barrett, Russell Westbrook, um, Christian Wood. You know, the other players going here, 50 is a dream, whereas Brogdon, 50 is everything going right. Everything doesn't usually go right, but no, yeah. But, Stars align, it, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think that he's, he is falling back and, and like, Theoretically, we think of like Derek White taking a big jump up with Marcus Smart moving. Well, well, why can't Brogdon get that same jump as well? Yeah. I would say because his elbow's stuffed and, um, yep. and his body breaks down, and and that would be the thing that that prevents me from really believing in that. But say that whatever again, like everything goes right and the body is good, then then yeah, it, it could definitely be that, and it could be that for a couple of months, and then it breaks down, and then you drop him, and that's fine mm-hmm. in your second last round, like. Whatever. I mean, most of these players are getting dropped within the first two weeks. Yeah. Where that's just the reality. Yeah. Um, Denny Avdija, I'm I'm looking forward to including him in my waiver wire column as <laughs> the top pickup of week six. Yeah. Um, I, I I mean, <laughs> sorry to pick on you know whoever's drafting fifth here. Um, I mean, at this point, yeah, we, we, we're taking flyers. Uh, we're taking we're yeah. taking guys here. So I, I was a bit annoyed to see Josh Richardson go uh, a couple of picks before me. That he was he was a guy I was eyeing off, especially now that Lillard isn't there. Their team is really yeah. not very deep at all, and uh, he's going to be able really to do a fair, a fair bit for them. Um, since your pick, I'll, I'll recap a few things. So after you picked Brogdon, it went Westbrook, Jalen Johnson, who I do like, but again probably not going to be very good at the start of the season. Um, Dylan Brooks, you also went. We might touch on that in a second. Christian Wood, uh, Beauchamp. Um, again, probably a bit of that recency bias with the trade. I don't think he's a 12-team guy. Um, Denny Avdia, Josh Richardson, uh, Grant Williams. I took Patrick Williams. Then Schroeder, um, Jarris Walker, Corey Kispert, Quinton Grimes, and Jalen Suggs off the board there. Um Let's talk. Let's talk. Bochamp. He, by no means, to me, is uh, close to a twelve-team um, league player. Even if he was to play twenty-eight, thirty minutes a night, he he doesn't very, have very good fantasy translation. So, uh, whilst he might be a winner in quotes of the trade, I don't think he's someone that we draft for for standard leagues. Yeah, he's he's one of the big winners of the trade, and also not a standard league draft pick. Yeah, uh, it's worth. You know, in Dynasty, his value definitely went up. In deep leagues, yes, draft him. But um, I, I, you don't, 
I don't want to draft anyone who I think can't be a top 100 player in a standard league. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't see just what you said. I, I don't think Beauchamp has that in his range of outcomes this year. Um, now, in a deeper league where the cut line isn't top 100, the cut line is top 150, then sure, go ahead, draft him, because he, absolutely, he has a lot of paths to top 150. But yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it. I agree with you. Um, I just had a little chuckle there because the uh, timer expired on Kyle here and he drafted the uh, the shittest bloke there in uh, Kevin Porter Jr. <laughs> who will not play a single second in the NBA this season, I don't no, believe. Maybe um, ever again. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I really don't know where to go here. Um, I'm just going to take a little fly here and I'm just going to go with Keontae. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong... Sorry, that was the wrong Keontae. Yeah, You're I'll, I'll run that back. <laughs> I clicked the wrong player there. Let's go. Where is Keontae George? Did I? Oh, no, he must have gone. When, where did he go? Oh, yeah, he went a couple of rounds ago. Oh, really? Uh, I must have missed 10, that. I just 11, chucked 7. him into my queue there. Okay, that was not the player. I right after Matherin. You, asked, you, were, you had just finished asking me about the Thompson twins. Oh, uh, there you go. All right, well, that was uh, something that I missed. But, okay, I will not be taking Keontae Johnson, who, yeah, that's not someone I'll take. Instead, I'll go to the next guy on my pick here, which is, again, I'm taking a flyer here, and I'm going to go with Colin Sexton, again, teammate of his, but... Could he come out and play 30 minutes, score 20 points efficiently? Um, they don't really have... They've got a weird kind of range in, in their um, uh, for their backcourt over in Utah. So whilst I'm not a big Sexton fan, there is utility in someone scoring 20 points a game at this point. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I was considering him a little bit ago. Um, he's, you know, he's someone who... I, I, similar to what I was saying with Beauchamp, like... In a 16-team league, in a 20-team league, he's absolutely going before the 14th round. Yeah. But because he's going to provide top 120 value probably. Yeah. But his the problem is that he's unlikely to provide sort of top 100. Yeah. And so in a smaller league, the upside isn't enough to really bother. But, I, yeah, it's a totally reasonable pick. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've gone He's fourteen. Draft, we've gone fourteen yeah. um, spots um, deep. So yeah. maybe sometimes this is a spot deeper than regular drafts. I like to go fourteen deep in most of my twelve team leagues, just because I think um, you know having that extra re- bench spot is is worthwhile. But yeah, some drafts you might should be always different. have an even number. If yeah. you're snaking, you need to have an even number. Like the the, the difference is minor, but like. You are giving if you have an odd number, you are that's just another advantage you're giving for those early picks yeah. with an early pick. Yeah. Um Agreed. and they already come in with a little bit of an advantage. So I kind of wanna go a little off the board here, but I desperately need centers. So I'm gonna take Nas Reed um for my last pick. You know, what if something happens to Gobert? What if something happens to Cat? Um He's probably going to get dropped quickly, but a preseason injury, and I used yep. my last pick on a on a guy. Um, I would have loved to have taken Caleb Martin there, uh, who um, or not Caleb, I, um, uh, Gabe Vincent. Oh uh, yeah, um, did Gabe Vincent go? I don't remember seeing him go. Let me double check no. that one for you there. I, uh, no, I, no I, when I dropped I him, he's he's. As I said before, I like to spend late round picks on rookies, and it's actually pretty weird that I didn't get any rookies in this draft late. Um, but the the concept is take someone late who yeah. could end up with a big jump in value, and I think with both Brogdon and Brooks, I did that. Um, and Gabe Vincent, like, are we sure he's not the starting point guard? Are, are we sure? Like, I know, like, it's less than 50% chance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but, like, but you take that swing. Yeah. How much less? Yeah. Is it, yeah, is I, it I like think, I think 20% it's, or is it like 48%? Yeah, maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, 30, 35. But my, my thing would be, even if he is a starting point guard, how high could he go? Um, yeah. You, sure. you've, got, you've got a team that's running through LeBron. Um, so... You've got Austin Reeves there. So, I mean, yeah, I think he could be a guy, but 
at the same time, I, I don't know if even if he was the starting point guard, how high would he be able to go? But again, we're going pretty di- pretty deep here, which yeah. that was what you were pick one sixty seven. So uh, even if he doesn't crack top one hundred, if he's one twenty, that's forty spots of value. So um, keep that in mind. So. That will do it for the, the draft there. Let's walk maybe through and just summarize our teams and um, I guess our general strategy and some the picks that we liked and di- didn't like. Um, I'll throw it back over to you. H- how did you feel like your, your team shaped up in this mock draft, picking Luka Doncic at pick two there? Um, and uh, was there any particular punt strategies or things that you went through in there uh, going through with, uh, obviously, with Zion? I'm just, um, guessing you punted free throw percentage in there as well. So I loved... I loved how I started this draft and um, I think that talking through it really hurt me in the second half, in the second half of the draft. So, you know, starting Luca, Bain, Kessler, Jalen, Zion, I'm very happy with that. And at that moment I said, all right, I should probably just punt free throws at this point. And what I kind of ended up doing was not really that I, I took, I sort of alternated between guys who really helped me in free throws and guys who work for punt free throws. So I could, and in the moment, my idea was like, well, when Zion's hurt, I can like easily pivot. Right. Um, but I, I don't think that that's actually a good strategy. And I don't <laughs> think, I think, I think that if I wasn't trying to make sure to comment as we were going, I would have been more, um, deliberate on that you know i think i would have taken for example J- Jakob potal went right after simons i probably would have taken potal there instead of simons um and then you know instead of collins um maybe a Derek white or an austin reeves uh, i think i would have been happier if i had done that yeah. but um i don't hate it i love the start i like the i do like the value on collins at seven two and marcus smart at eight eleven I, I like the value on Gary Trent and Bogdan, Bogdanovich late. So I feel like I got some mixed feelings. Love the start. The rest is okay. I, I think I like the start as well. Again, we, we've discussed and we, we've talked about the Walker Kessler pick, so that's where we have some different opinion. But that's that's what people come to the watch the show for. So you know, absolutely, you can you can align with with one or the other. Um, so uh, I, I think I, I enjoyed my. Draft there, I think, um, started off with a lot of scoring, which was a, a big target of mine in, in Steph, Kyrie, Market, and Poole to allow myself to get some of these uh, poorer scorers later, like a Gobert, like a Duran, like a Robert Williams. Um, a couple of guys there that I think just were in the right spot in a Franz Wagner and Miles Bridges that just to fill out my wings. Um, don't necessarily think there's huge value there, maybe with Bridges, um, but... Again, just kind of solid options to, to sort of round out those forward spots. Uh, the Zubats pick, just, yeah, I don't know, just lost lost track of time there and picked him. Um, probably could have gone something different there. But quickly, again, someone I think is being underrated. Um, and then some upside picks with Murphy. If he comes back and he's healthy, he could be good. Patrick Williams. Uh, I'm not expecting a huge jump from him, but again, year four, young player. He was one of the youngest players in his draft. He might just be taking that little bit of time. He at least can give me some defensive stats. And then, again, just a, a late round shot of some scoring for Colin Sexton. Um, so, yeah, I think all in all went pretty solid. Probably could have gone a little bit more on some better centers earlier. So, I'm really relying on Duran taking that next step. Um, I'm really relying on Robert Williams being healthy, so that's probably the weakness of my team. Um, Gobert, does his blocks go back anywhere close to the two-plus blocks per game? Um, So that's probably the weakness of my squad there. Um, So that's maybe something I'd focus on a little bit more early, but outside of that, I think I'm really strong in points, threes, free throw percentage. and uh, I think you're underselling the value of of Franz at 6'5". I I think that's better than just... Fine. I think I think that's good. That might be very good. It might be very good. Um, I sometimes with me with Franz, I just struggle to figure out. Okay, I know he's going to be better because he's a great young player. But where is he better? Is he yeah. is he a twenty five point per game shooter? Is he a guy that hits three threes? Does he get six assists? Like I just don't know. I mean, does it do? Does he do all of those things? Um, I would be shocked if that happens. But I, he's so a really good player. You're, you're touching on something that's actually kind of like a, a bugaboo of mine. And, you know, I, I, what you just described is something very, very common. You'll hear a ton of analysts um, say very similar things about players, especially young players, where um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, I was on a pod with Dan Besbris who said word for word what you just said about Jalen Brown the year before Jalen Brown took his big leap. Yeah. And, and the, the, Young players are going to get better. It's okay to not perfectly understand or anticipate where that's going to be. Um, I, I think we spend almost too much effort worrying about that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, um, I get that. I, I think it's more just in terms of like making it a build of a team. That's where it sometimes yeah. gets a bit more difficult. But like, I mean, I took him there because I think he has no matter how he gets there, he has an ability to beat that spot. So, yes. um, and, and I didn't think that there was anyone there that was perfect for my fit or what I needed. So for me, the, the guy that I took there was just the best player, I think, on the board that has a chance to far exceed yeah. that. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of the, the, the strategy there. But let us know now in the comments below, guys, what you think about both mine or Rick Al- uh, Alex's draft. Are you on my side or Alex's side on the, the Walker Kessler debate? Um, <laughs> we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, but let us know what you got going on at the moment, Alex? Any um, uh, any things coming out? Content that you're pumping out at the moment, leading up to the NBA season? Just keep an eye on um, keep an eye on my Twitter. Keep an eye on RotoWire, uh, and you'll see some stuff. And um, then once the season kicks up, you'll see my weekly waiver wire columns on RotoWire and CBS. Where can people find you on Twitter? Just for the audio listeners as well. Just my last name: R I K L E E N at Rick Clean. Okay, perfect. Yep, go and give him a follow over on there and make sure, yep, check out all of the stuff. He's got some great content coming out, guys. And uh, always good to get lots of different perspectives in the fantasy basketball community. Don't just listen to my title takes every time because I will not be right 100% of the time. No one will be, but the more info you can gather and soak in, the better you'll be at your fantasy basketball drafts. But that will do it for us today, guys. Make sure you hit the big thumbs up button down below if you're watching on YouTube. Give this a five-star rating on review on um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and head over to ballboysambio.com. Get your season guide now, and we'll see you guys next time. Laters. Laters.